There's two F words, really. There's faith and there's fear. Those don't go together. Welcome to Faith Chicago. I don't think it's necessary to rattle off a bunch of statistics to confirm what most of us know about the state of public education in Chicago. We know that some CPS schools are outstanding, but many schools, especially those in fragile communities, are low performing and failing to prepare students for success in life. Today we're going to talk about education with a highly respected educator, but first, Here's a comment from one high school teacher in the Chicago Public Schools. If we cared enough about the kids who live in these communities, I think of one of the schools that we're going to work in, and when we talk about media portrayal, what was all over the media last year about this particular school is that they had rats in the school, and they were even showing pictures of rat droppings and saying how deplorable it is for kids to have to be educated in these type of environments. So it goes back to injustice in this word care that I'm bringing to bear right now. So there's a sense that we cared enough collectively, and I'm using we very broadly right now, we will fix that. I feel like the ingenuity, the creativity, whatever financial resources we need exist, that if we wanted to direct said resources to facilities like this one that I just gave as one example, but there are hundreds of those schools and hundreds of examples of disinvestment in Chicago, it will get fixed. But it's just as simple as we have to care enough about the kids who are in these institutions. And then when we just bring our faith into perspective, there's a sense that when we look at scripture, I believe that it's very clear that these are in fact the very communities that God tells us to prioritize in many ways. If we see our brothers and our sisters in deplorable situations, I just feel like personally I know about me and I believe that this will strike a chord with other people there should be a sense internally that we got to do something about that. And I believe that there's enough people saying that we got to do something about that, that the resources exist, that the people are there that can make positive change and impact and even quite quickly in, in some of these educational environments. Marilyn Rames joins me to discuss the state of education in Chicago. Marilyn has taught in many arenas of education, district, charter, and she's even homeschooled. She will be getting her PhD in education policy from the University of Arkansas. She's also the author of The Master Teacher, 12 Spiritual Lessons That Can Transform Schools and Revolutionize Public Education. So glad you're with us here today, Marilyn. So glad to be here, thank you. What is your reaction to Damien's comments? We're striving for basic amenities in Chicago public schools and it does to me come down to how much do you care about the students that are in your care. Describe the state of education then in Chicago, how you see it. I think that there are individuals who care deeply about students, but collectively the agency that's necessary to move the needle isn't there. So what we have is it the infrastructure? The infrastructure, the system itself, keeps things as they are. It keeps the status quo. We need a major disruption in the way we do public education in Chicago, and I haven't seen that disruptor yet in my 15 years working in CPS. And you've looked for it. Absolutely. And I've strived to be an agent of disruption in many ways, um, which is why I've authored a book, why I've written a blog for eight years, why I've um, gotten fired, <laughs> because I've voiced very direct concerns about things that are happening, yeah. but it's not set up for dissension. It's not really set up for challenge and questions and all the things that education is supposed to produce, which is freedom of speech and intellect and exchange of ideas. It's kind of like, this is how the system works and you need to kind of follow that system. 
you may not have experienced exactly what Damien was um, talking about, you know, in his excerpt, but what kinds of things did you discover in the classroom? I had um, 33 third graders in one classroom with no support, where a third of the class could read at third grade level, a third of the class couldn't read at a kindergarten level, and a third of the class read above third grade level, and it's just me. Um, I've had situations where there was no nurse in the schools, where I had a third grader come in high on marijuana, and you could smell it on him, you could see it in his eyes, that he was sleepy, I sent him to the office and said, you know, we need help, and they say, nope, send them back to class and just do your job. So there are, there's a lack of um, appropriate social services mm -hmm. that um, you as a teacher experience on a daily basis, and a lot of times it's um, pretty much pitted on the budget. But Okay, yeah. and speaking to that, aren't many schools in the poorest communities failing? They're struggling. I hate to use the word failing. Okay. It's a very strong word and it, it hurts because the kids are not failing. The kids are a victim of what they've been offered. I like the term struggle. Yeah, and so they, they need support. We shouldn't view them as failures. We should view them as open-minded, ready to absorb information like any yeah. other young person and they're just not given that opportunity. Our expectations, I believe, in Chicago are not as high as they need to be, where now I hear from teachers saying all the time, um, well, now uh, a failing grade is, or a C is a 59% now. Um, or we'll have, you know, there's no um, attendance requirement to pass so you can miss half the school year and you can still be passed and I think a lot of these like um, concessions are made to not make the district look as bad as it would look if we were completely and totally honest about what's going on. Coming up Marilyn will discuss the digital divide that can separate students. That's next after the break. Welcome back. Today I'm talking with educator and author Marilyn Rames about education. Middle-aged adults today use encyclopedias and books to do our homework. But for today's students, the internet has become their most important learning tool. That's why Comcast has created the program Internet Essentials to help low-income students cross the digital divide. The internet is this fantastic equalizer. I mean, being on the internet gives you the opportunity to equalize opportunity, and yet because of this digital divide, the internet is actually exacerbating differences instead of bringing people together. The sad irony is that there are still large numbers of Americans who are not connected to the internet. Households living in cities with the highest poverty rates are up to 10 times more likely not to have a broadband connection at home than households living in wealthier neighborhoods. I've heard stories that Dave told about mothers and fathers and grandparents taking their kids and parking in the parking lot of an establishment just so that their kids could be able to do their homework. In this country, in this city, with the wealth and the talent that we have, that should never, ever be a thing that happens. Internet connectivity is, is truly essential. You can't look for a job. You can't do your homework. You really can't function in today's world of technology without having internet access. And to offer a program with free um, hookup for $10 a month, that's pretty great. One of TLN's core values is giving back to the communities we serve. We share that value with Comcast. That's why we're excited about programs like Internet Essentials, which serves more people than ever, including many of our very own viewers. Here in the local region, how has Internet Essentials impacted the community? Well, since 2011, Comcast has uh, 
signed up more than 380,000 families and uh, individuals to the program, many for the very first time. We are now extending eligibility to all low-income residents. All you have to do is qualify as a low-income resident. We're trying to make that as easy as possible by saying if you qualify for any uh, public, for any um, public assistance benefit program, you're eligible for this. I'm very appreciative of Comcast coming into our neighborhood, bringing the internet into the homes of every uh, marginalized person because they have a goal of just simply bridging the digital divide. That's very much needed and it's necessary. And so I'm excited about that because when you bridge the d digital divide, you also help bridge the economic divide ultimately and the literacy divide. Why does Comcast do this? So Comcast really truly believes in uh, giving back to the community. We uh, look at the community in a way in which uh, if the, the community is thriving, then we as a company can thrive in that community. So we, we try to give back in many different ways through our foundation work, through uh, our initiative, Internet Essentials program, um, through scholarships. Um, if you're not connected these days, you have, uh, you have you're truly left behind. Marilyn, how important is it that all students have access to the internet and technology? It is extremely important. There, there's a downside to too much technology, as we all know, and it's how you use the technology that makes it the biggest difference, but you have to have it have in to order have it. to have the discernment as to how to use it. That all being said, it is true, we live in a technological age and this is where the future jobs are going as well. Uh, a quote I think from you, technology is the force that is greater than any segregation law that ever existed. When we make everything so technological and people don't have the technology or access to the, the tools then we've basically segregated ourselves and those who have and those who have not. Up next, Marilyn is going to talk about how teachers can share their faith in today's classrooms. It's possible. She's also going to tell us about the organization she started, Teachers Who Pray. So stay with us. Welcome back to Face Chicago. Today, educator Marilyn Rames is my guest. Marilyn is the founder of Teachers Who Pray and the author of The Master Teacher, 12 Spiritual Lessons That Can Transform Schools and Revolutionize Public Education. And we need to revolutionize it. Yeah. So uh, why did you start Teachers Who Pray? Why did you start the organization? There are so many believers so many Christian believers in Chicago Public Schools. Wow. And they pray yeah. within themselves, but what would happen if we came together and prayed after school or before school or on a duty-free yes. lunch break and with no kids in the room? And, and what would happen? So I slowly started asking people to pray with me and it just kind of flourished and grew. And, um, you know, Jesus, was a revolutionary. He was a revolutionary and he used love as the revolution. And though I talked a lot in this interview about all these injustices and um, things that are wrong and these massive problems, but love will fix all of those problems. If you just combine your heart with someone else's heart and just roll up your sleeves and get it done, we can fix the problem. And I'm not a hero. I made a lot of mistakes, especially in my early years of teaching, because I was going in my own strength. I was gonna tell that principal <laughs> that this is not right. I was going to write out- I was a, a journalist I was in a New York journalist. City. Yes. I know what I'm doing. I have a voice. I can see a story yes. from a mile away. <laughs> And the schools were full of stories and it's hard to watch adults yeah. who are in charge yeah. of helping kids not do their job. And I'm like, oh, I just want to tell this story, but I want to fix it. I want to fix it. Yeah. I want to sound the alarm. 
But God had to humble me and let me know, you're, I didn't make you an educator to fight this way. This is a spiritual battle. Prayer and faith. In yes. fact, you call faith the F word. There's two F words, really. There's faith and there's fear. And those don't go together. And Jesus told us, don't fear, be not afraid. I am with you and I'll be with you to the end of this world. Don't be afraid to, you have to know the law. And the law says a teacher before school or after school is a regular citizen, regular person. We are not agents of the state after school unless we're monitoring children like as a coach or something like that. For the state. For the state. Yeah. But when we walk in the school doors, we do not have to leave our faith at the front door. And I mean, I have prayed with parents. There is no law that says I can't because they, they're adults. They are consenting adults. Yes. Um, but I would say 98% of all parents, no matter where they're from or where they live, they love their children. Yes. And they want the best for their children. And if you go in as a teacher with that mindset, no matter how difficult that child is, you will know that you can make a difference yes. if you partner with that parent. Now, I had a student who I, in my early years of teaching, dubbed him first name will not, last name do right. In my mind, <laughs> I go, oh, there comes will not do right, because you tell him to go right, he went left. Well, one day, he, I don't remember what he did, but I put him in a timeout at the table and I said, write down what you did and tell me how you're gonna fix it. He wrote an apology letter and I have it today. And in this letter, he had a kid with a cry, crying face and he says, I apologize, everything was misspelled, right? He's third grade. I apologize for my behavior. I won't do it again. I am so sorry. And then he wrote at the bottom, I wish you were my mother. And I said, Lord, forgive me for calling him will not do right, because that is not his name. This child wishes that I was his mother. I am not judging his mother. I don't know exactly what's go what was going. I know there were problems, but the kids need us. And God has placed us there in that classroom as his agent. And really what I started saying, I talked to myself a lot. I started to say, Lord, you are the parent of these children. These are, they're children of God. That means you're their father. So I'm working for you to serve your children. And it's never too late. You could start now. Parent teachers can start now. It's never too late it's for a child. It's never too yeah. late. It's never too late. But the moment that parent says something disparaging about that teacher at home, uh, they've lost the kid. Okay, They've let's talk about that respect. more with educator Marilyn Rames when we come back. Today, Marilyn Rames has been tutoring me on the state of education and the important role of both teachers and parents in the education of children. Marilyn is the founder of Teachers Who Pray. And that organization is continuing. Yes, correct. absolutely. Give me one game-changing solution mm -hmm. that parents can do to help improve the education of their children, what would that be? It would be to read to their child at home. Well, make sure that the children are reading. If they're older, make sure that they're reading at least 20 minutes a day, perhaps an hour a day, but that's a game-changer. Mm -hmm. And how can the church assist schools? Well, churches have students, churches have teachers, and churches have parents. So the pastors and leaders of the church understanding the issues that exist in public education, they reach into so many demographics right there in their church. And they're reaching into the community that maybe don't go to church. And there's many ways that um, churches can partner with their neighboring public school to provide resources and volunteers and space in their facilities in various ways that they can um, support the schools and it's absolutely necessary. This is how we are the light 
into the world by coming outside of our churches and engaging with the families and kids in our community and they all go to school. So that's one way to find them. So if the Chicago school system turned around, the students would improve. Absolutely. It's not a lost cause. It just takes a lot more elbow grease because the, the students, at, you know, they, they're overcoming hurdles before they even get to school. So you have to work even harder. You have to be a little more creative and um, have more tenacity. I have no doubt that the kids that we serve in Chicago Public Schools can go to college, can do well. Um, and maybe some after school programs. And that's where parents or Christians can actually get involved as well, is and perhaps in an after school program. Exactly. Okay. And the district can increase its efforts and double up and, and hold those dollars accountable for getting the job done. Yeah. Can't just throw money at it. You have to make sure that it's being used properly and you have to be on top of it. And pray. And, and pray. pray. Yes. Thanks for being with us today. Thank Appreciate you. It's been a pleasure. Bill Gates says research indicates that if you want your child to get the best education possible, it's more important to get him assigned to a great teacher than to a great school. And this should be an encouragement to all parents because there are gifted and dedicated teachers like Marilyn in every school. So as a parent, advocate for your children. Get them assigned to the best teachers possible. And take Marilyn's advice about working in cooperation with the teacher to determine what your child may need and how you can support them best at home. Also, we at Faith Chicago would like to support and serve you. If you have a prayer need, please call our Care Force toll free. And thanks for watching and remember that TLN is donor supported, so consider partnering with us. We'll see you again next time on Faith Chicago.